Timothy Pucker. I'm the CEO of the Wireless Innovation Forum, and I'd like to welcome you to this 10th in our webinar series. Today's webinar is, going to, is on declarative policies for DSA. Uh, before we get started, a little bit of information on the, uh, on the webinar and, and how it works. Um, first, slides that are going to be presented during this webinar are going to be posted on our webinars, tutorials, and resources page on the website. I'm showing the website on the screen here. Um, if uh, anybody has any questions, please feel free to contact me at any time. Um, the interface that you're working with today from GoToWebinar uh, has a, a number of controls, and I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to the control panel so that you uh, can understand them during the, during the session. Um, first is the audio mode. Um, default for it is to use your microphone and speakers on your computer. Um, should you, you can minimize and maximize the control panel screen by using the little button uh, shown here. If you wish to dial in using your telephone, uh, simply click the use telephone button on your screen and then a dial in number and access code will be presented. The audio pin is the pin that allows um, you to, to access the screen, so please uh, be sure and enter your audio pin when you, when you enter the webinar. Uh, if you have a question during this session, uh, go ahead and you, there's two ways of uh, getting attention. The first is to type your question into the questions window shown on your screen. Uh, those questions then will come to me and I can pass them on to, to the presenter today as, as they go. The other way is to, um, to, to ask a question is there's a little hand button on your control panel. If you click that, that will essentially raise your hand and notify us that you would like your microphone turned on so that you can ask a question and we'll manage those as we go. Uh, the speaker is asked to uh, say to manage questions as we go, so you know, feel free to ask questions along the way. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mitch Kokar, today's speaker. Uh, Mitch is with Northeastern University and Vistology Incorporated. Um, Mitch is going to be talking on declarative languages for DSA. Good morning. So do I have the screen control now? You um, should not. OK. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Mitch Kokar, as we just introduced. And um, the, talk, the, to the topic has been introduced already. Uh, I, before I start, I just would like to say that um, whatever I'm presenting here today is strongly uh, influenced by my association with three um, organizations or efforts. So for one, uh, I am the chair of the Wireless, of wireless Infor Information Innovation Forum Working Group on Modeling Language for Mobility, or MLM. Second, um, my um, work has been influenced by the DARPA program XG, uh, was in the past, but I was very closely associated with the program as, as an advisor to the program, not as a performer. And um, third, um, I am a member of the P1900.5 um, standardization effort to standardize the policy language. Um, so that's that's um, for essentially particularly for dynamic spectrum access. So these are the three kind of sources of. Um, influence uh, on me. Uh, today I'd like, I have 50 slides and I think uh, we should be okay. Um, so uh, the objective is first of all um, to discuss the basic concepts of policy-based dynamic spectrum access radio system. So I'm, I, this is the terminology, maybe not all, maybe I'm not familiar with this, but this is the terminology that was used by the IEEE P1900.5 standard, so that I, I use it from time to time just to say that it's not just radios, but it might be more than just radios. Um, so the second thing is to discuss the computer infrastructure that support the implementation of this kind of a, a, a approach to PBDRS, in particular the language, the representation, and the tools, in particular automatic inference. Um, I'll try to explain the approach as much as I can, and um, if, if you, there are any 
issues with, understand, with the understanding of the approach, uh, please ask questions, please interrupt me. Uh, and finally, in the end, um, um, I'd like to devote maybe like 20% uh, of this presentation, maybe 30%. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, cognitive radius that in not just for DSA but for something more too. Um, so first of all, um, obviously this is about DSA, so the dynamic spectrum access. So uh, I have two slides. This one is just says um, spectrum is a valid resource. I guess that's probably a very trivial um, statement. The, the, there is a shortage of spectrum. Again, everybody agrees and knows about this, I think. Um, but uh, but in, it, what's really paradoxical here, then even though the spectrum is such a val valuable resource and uh, there is shortage of spectrum, at least apparent, but at the same time it looks like the, uh, as far as I know, uh, the use of, uh, of the spectrum is not terribly efficient. So, so these are the slides. Um, prepared by the XG program um, where uh, the upper left corner shows that the spectrum is kind of a sign so therefore it looks like there's no free spectrum almost but then when you look at the, the, uh, the usage it looks the occupancy is like six percent um, and um, it, and it's uh, it depends it also it, it, in this case it's in frequency but but it also uh, depends on the location and the time so it, varies from, from time to time, from location to location. So the, the XG approach was to, to introduce this kind of um, um, kind of uh, OODA loop um, uh, cognitive process where the spectrum is sensed and, and characterized and react and then the nodes react and pick particular um, spectrum bands um, with obviously some kind of control and the control has to be um, and controlled by policies. Um, so the previous picture was mainly about um, the, uh, the uh, commercial picture, but but a similar issue, although on a somewhat different time scale, exists in the in the military domain, in particular. So here is here is an excerpt from uh, from the U.S. Army Field Manual, FM 24-2. Chapter four, which which essentially says that spectrum needs to be managed, and in this case, the management of the spectrum uh, has to be done for particular missions. So, apparently, um, there are many uh, officers working on uh, on managing the spectrum uh, for particular missions. So, this is on a very short time scale. It's not like with commercial, where where this goes from um, uh, very infrequently, but but in, in the military, it might be done on very frequently. So the question is, could this be, um, uh, could this process be somehow automated rather than uh, purely manual? So to, <laughs> um, so the, the question if is, if the spectrum is to be managed, the question is, uh, how can it be done? Uh, in particular, uh, when you go and read the literature on the spectrum, at least what that's what I did, I found that there are essentially the classification of two approaches, uh, two basic approaches to spectrum management. One is centralized and the other is de decentralized. So in the centralized approach, uh, there is a, um, a controller, central controller, um, that, that decides uh, which spectrum to assign to whom, and possibly a database of spectrum assignments is, is kept, like in, for instance, uh, white space. Um, but um, but there's, in this decentralized, on the other hand, um, it's um, a, sometimes referred to as dynamic spectrum selection or DSS. Um, in this case, the nodes uh, decide this kind of autonomously uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer possible basis. Um, so, so these are the two basic uh, approaches. Now, the question is, before we go into some details, the question is, is should the assignments be fair? In, in, in the sense that should we always care about non-interference, should we always care about giving the same amount of spectrum to every spectrum user or, uh, or not? And the answer is not necessarily, it all depends on, on the situation. So for instance, in the, um, in the tactical battlefield dynamic spectrum access, it's, it 
usually it isn't fair. For instance, if the U.S. Uh, moves into an area where there is a war going on, and obviously nobody cares about uh, maybe well, maybe the policy might be okay. I don't care about this uh, use, this kind of users or that kind of users, and just take that spectrum. And that's it. Um, but um, so it depends uh, on the policy in the particular situation. Um, Similarly, in the public safety domain, again, the question is should it be fair or not? So the question is should, should the fireman or a medic who participates in some kind of emergency response situation should be given the same kind of access rights as, as the person who is chatting about uh, where to go for dinner or something like that. So, um, so not necessarily it has to be fair and it can vary from time to time, from situation to situation. Um, that's at least uh, my understanding. Um, so with this, um, I'd like to go and discuss a little bit uh, of this uh, scenario of the central um, control of spectrum. So as you can see in this case, uh, what I'm trying to show in this picture is that the base station makes the spectrum assignment decisions so, so the, spec, the, the, the base can, can check uh, which spectrum, uh, which parts of the spectrum are occupied by particular uh, handsets and therefore users, and then, and then decide what to assign to this particular user. So that was a use case that was discussed at the Wireless Innovation Forum in quite, quite detail. And that use case was uh, described in this document here uh, down below. It's a SDR forum document. It is uh, available publicly available because it was voted out by the by the forum, and, um, and so anybody can read this document. Where uh, like seven or so use cases for um, the use of cognitive radio and the use of policies has been described. Um, but this use case is about um, the dynamic spectrum access. So in this case, there is a base, like in the previous picture, and there is a handset. So these are two, two types of users. Obviously, the fact that there is only one handset here does not mean that there is only one handset. It's just one type of actor. Um, so in, in the forum, uh, in the MLM work group, we discussed uh, the sequence of events that can take place in this kind of situation. So. So in this case, the assumption is that the base station knows um, exactly which spectrum is utilized. And um, uh, so it keeps an up-to-date database or table of which spectrum is occupied and by whom. Um, so, but uh, the dynamic spectrum access uh, obviously is costly. So therefore, it might not be um, uh, active all the time. It might be invoked only when there is some kind of overload situation. So um, in that case, suppose a handset H1 requests uh, a voice call initialization, and so that base station has to, to decide which channel to select. So it has its own policies, like everything here. It says that um, the base station and uh, handset 1 follow their own policies. So there, that's, this is not necessarily <coughs> one common policy, but it could be one common policy. So, uh, the, so then the base station selects a specific channel and informs uh, the handset which channel to use, and 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 then um, and uh, and so on. So, uh, when uh, when the base station confirms that it is okay now to use, then the H1 starts to send data traffic to to the base station using this channel. Um, so acknowledgments might be involved, and um, and then uh, if something fails, then the steps from three should be repeated. Um, so this this um, whole sequence is um, was analyzed at the f uh, at the forum and considered a valid um, DSA scenario. Um, and um, so the goal of the MLM work group was to express all of this in a specific language, in the policy language. And that's what we have done. So all those terms here, uh, so it, th this is kind of a UML representation, a sequence diagram, uh, which represents the sequence of events roughly as in the previous picture. Not, not with all of the detail as in the previous picture, but pretty close. 
uh, the importance of this sequence diagram is that um, all of the terms here, like scan, all channels, um, update, has capacity, uh, capacity threshold, and so on, these are terms from, <coughs> from the dictionary uh, that the policies can understand and, uh, and the interpreter of the policies can understand. So therefore, everything is expressed here um, in, 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 a, in a language. Uh, that is understood by, in this case, an engine at the base and a base station and also at another engine running at the handset. So those engines um, invoke, for instance, um, operations, like in this case, receive packet data. So everything is done in terms of that language. Um, this use case, as I said before, is, has been described in this, uh, in this uh, forum document. Now, <clears throat> if we want to uh, implement something like this, um, it has to be implemented in some kind of an architecture, to be more specific, because in the previous picture I just showed the base station and the handset. But now, what's inside of the base station and the handset? What kind of architecture are those um, platforms running? Um, so here, in this picture, I'm showing a an architecture which is very closely, um, it might be a little bit simplified architecture, but the architecture was also accepted by the P1900.5 effort um, with, as, as a kind of almost like a reference architecture. It was not a requirement, it was, it was just informational only, but um, in, in this case, I'm also stressing this, that this is not necessarily the only architecture, but this is the architecture in terms of which I'm trying to explain the operation of, of this kind of a radio. So as you can see, <coughs> uh, the, the radio platform is, is here, and this is um, for either the base station or the, or the, the, uh, or the uh, handset. Um, there, is, there is an assumption that there is some kind of a repository of policies and those policies, appropriate policies, are loaded on, on the local node, so either head, hands, the handset or the base station. So, and those policies are inside of, of the module, which is called here Policy Conformance Reasoner, sometimes referred to as PCR, Policy Conformance Reasoner. And there is another uh, reasoner involved here, which we call System Strategy Reasoner. Again, this is the terminology from P1905. Another component, which is policy enforcer. And finally, the rest of the radio is shown here as a radio platform. A sensor might be involved in, obviously, an RF link. So <clears throat> what, what, what happens here, uh, whenever a radio platform wants to send a uh, use, uh, transmit message, uh, it, it has to ask the system strategy reasoner whether it's OK to transmit. And the system strategy reasoner then has to ask the uh, policy conformance reason or whether this transmission, uh, given such and such parameters, is legal or not. If it is okay, then uh, then the policy um, reasoner will, the PCR will say, yeah, it's okay, and also will inform the policy enforcer. So the policy enforcer, which is kind of a gatekeeper here, will allow the platform to uh, to transmit. So that's the architecture that was proposed in the P1900 for roughly, and again, like I said, I, this is somewhat simplified. Um, so in this, ar uh, in this uh, architecture, the assumption is that policies uh, can be loaded and modified at runtime, not, not necessarily like before you deploy. Um, and that policies can be verified uh, and policies can be checked for validity. Uh, and then after that, the request for transmission can be verified against policies. Um, and um, a, a kind of a bigger picture of, of what I showed in the previous one is shown in this uh, sequence diagram. Uh, this sequ <coughs> sequence diagram was contributed by Vince Kovarik to, to the P1900.5 uh, effort. You can I actually, I could click on this, uh, on this <laughs> but uh, this diagram is viewed um, better in a separate file. So, so the next two uh, slides show this diagram, but unfortunately this diagram is not particularly readable. So instead, uh, I'm going to show you the, um, the PDF version of this diagram. 
separately. So, um, so as you can see in this, uh, in th this is a bigger picture, like I said before. So the assumption here is that the policies have to be loaded on the radio using the um, um, po uh, po policy um, management point, PMP. This is the terminology used particularly in, um, in the area of security, uh, for instance, Zacamo standard uh, uses this kind of terminology, the PMP policy management point. So, um, so the policy manage management point is uh, asked uh, whether this policy can be loaded on this radio. So the, uh, so the policy management point asks the radio interface, can I load this, um, uh, this policy? So the radio has to uh, check its own repository manager in this case and check for the validity um, for this PMP. So maybe not. If, if, if this is not valid, then this is an alternative flow of events. And in that case, uh, the request is turned down, and that's it. On the other hand, if it is valid, then the request, um, uh, the answer goes back and says, OK, you can load the policy. So the, lo the policy is loaded, and after that, the policy has to, um, to be verified. And again, uh, in some cases, the, this policy might not be verified. In that case, um, the, the negative re 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 reply is sent back, and that's it. There's the policy cannot be um, uh, loaded. But however, if it, it is OK, then the policy is installed in the local repository of the PCR. And then, um, again, the PCR can still check whether the policy is legit or not. If the policy is OK, then the, uh, the policy is finally installed and, and, and requests uh, against this policy can be um, issued as, as shown in the previous sequence diagram. Okay, so, so now back to, this, uh, to these slides. So like I said, these, these two diagrams are um, inserted just in case, but they are very difficult to read. So here are some examples of potential policies. So here's an, and these are examples taken primarily from, um, at least two of them are from the XG work, but another one is not from XG, but it doesn't matter. I, I'm showing you just three uh, simple examples, and those policies would be way, way more complicated. <clears throat> so in the, fir the first case, um, the policy says a node can transmit in frequency range 350 to 270 megahertz between the hours of 1100 and 1200. Okay, so that's a policy. Um, in this case, the policy is written in text. Okay, obviously text is difficult to interpret by the radios. So, in order to um, for uh, for the SSR to uh, for PCR sorry to uh, decide whether uh, a specific request is uh, is uh, should be allowed or not, the SSR must provide some additional data to it. So first of all, the, the two, the SSR and the PCR must understand which request it is. So this is the ID of the request. Then it says, okay, what kind of request is this? What kind of type of request? So in this case, it says transmit. And then in this case, the policy, because the policy refers to the range, so obviously the range has to be provided. So for instance, 355 to 360. And then transmit time, so in this case, for instance, uh, 1105, 11, um, uh, 10. So, and the reason is because, again, this policy requires this kind of thing. Um, so the, in this case, the PR, uh, PCR, sorry, uh, returns the, it says this transmission is allowed. So it says T001, which is the transmission ID, allowed, and uh, type, Okay, so it means that essentially that this transmission is the instance of this of this allowed class. Um, another example here: a policy, a node can transmit in the frequency range 350 to 370 megahertz in locations between latitude and longitude, like this. Okay, and again, because because the policy refers to location, um, the uh, PCR needs to, um, the policy reasoner uh, needs 
to have this data to about the location and, and frequency um, in order to, de to, de to determine whether uh, this policy is um, satisfied or not by this particular request. So in this case, the request is to transmit uh, in the frequency range 375 to 380, uh, which is outside of, of the allowed range. So therefore, the, uh, the, re the policy reason returns the uh, answer disallowed. And so the, the, the transmission cannot go. <coughs> Another example here, it's, um, it says that a node can transmit in the frequency range 350 to 270 MHz uh, if the security label of the node is at least secret. Um, so in this case, obviously, uh, the security label has to be provided, for instance, top secret. Um, so in this case, um, the return is allowed, uh, this transmission is allowed because top secret is higher than uh, then secret, so therefore, it's, and, and the policy says at least secret, so therefore this word at least must be understood somehow. And obviously in this case, uh, the policy reasoner needs some means to verify uh, the validity of the security label, because it's not enough that, um, that, that someone says, oh, I, I have top secret clearance, but the, the, uh, the reasoner has to be sure of this, so there are ways of doing this. And again, this is closely related to the architecture and, and the standard of ZACAML, for instance. Um, so, as, as I showed here, those policies are represented in text. Obviously, text is difficult, difficult to interpret by computers. So, so therefore, we, we should strive for some kind of a representation that is interpretable by computers. Um, so the, the simplest way and kind of the most natural way is to say, okay, let's represent this procedurally as a as procedural code with C, C++, or Java. Um, and, and so the, the, that's fine, and this is probably the, the kind of the most natural way to go. Uh, most of the people would probably choose this to say, okay, we implement those policies. However, the problem is that um, if we want to modify the policy, um, then we would, with each modification, we would, um, and also for interoperability, for running this policy on multiple platforms. So first of all, to run on different platforms, um, a set of um, policies like this, of code, procedural code, would have to be developed for each platform. For two, um, a, and for two, whenever we want to modify this, uh, the code would have to be rewritten, recompiled, reloaded, redeployed, and so on. Um, not only this, but pro probably recertification re might be needed uh, whenever, whenever the policies change. And the reason is because, because this, um, this code is certified by someone, and so therefore, uh, since we touch the code, the whole code, and since um, there's no kind of unique module where it is loaded, and possibly the whole uh, the whole node would have to be, the whole platform would have to be recertified. So another way of doing, uh, doing with this might be to say, okay, let's represent this in XML, uh, which is somewhat better than uh, C++ in, in terms of interoperability. However, XML requires procedural code, um, so the, uh, to interpret the XML tags, so, and again, separate for each platform, so again, the issues are almost like here, a little bit smaller, but still um, pretty big. So the third approach, and that's the approach that I'm trying to, to promote, is that uh, it represents um, not in XML, but uh, in, for instance, OWL, which underneath is XML, but, uh, but it has more structure than XML. Um, OWL, possibly something more like rules, for instance. Uh, in this case, we will require a generic interpreter running or on different platforms, um, and uh, we would need to load the new sets of policies, like I just showed in the, in the use case just a while ago. Um, uh, the, the interpreter does not need to be changed because the interpreter is specific to the language and not to the policies. So the interpreter is generic and still valid for as long as the language has not changed. Uh, and there is no need to recertify the interpreter because, because the interpreter was, might, might be certified just once. Okay, so, but to do this, um, uh, 
we need some kind of a common standard, possible standard vocabulary, so the policy reasoner can understand uh, this vocabulary. Um, so I kind of in the previous slides, I, I sh in in the three examples of policies, I highlighted some of uh, some of the terms in red. So those are like candidates that should go into the vocabulary, into the standard vocabulary. Um, and um, those, so that was just in text, but actually this, um, so the question is what kind of, what kind of things we need to have in the standard vocabulary. So first, so here's a list of those types of things. So first of all, we need specific individuals, like in this case, Jay Smith is a specific individual, or 1034, or Blue are specific individuals. But then we have sets of individuals, or actually more precisely, classes of individuals, like frequency, node, and set time. These are not specific individuals, but this is types, categories of individual classes. Um, so then find, and the third one is the relationships between among classes of individuals. For instance, here, um, such as like subclass relationships. So, for instance, handset is subclass of node, meaning that every handset is an instance of node. Aggregation or composition, like for instance, receiver is part of node, so it's a part of type relationship. And any other relationships that are specific to the domain, so like for instance, has frequency range, which is specific to the radio domain. Um, Okay, but also we, we need to represent not only among classes, the relationships between and among classes, but also between specific individuals. Like for instance, in this case, Jay Smith is part of Bravo, whatever, uh, platoon, for instance. So these are the, 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 the types that we need to, uh, to be able to represent in a standard vocabulary. A standard vocabulary could be represented also graphically. So in this case, for instance, radio is a subclass of component. This arrow here represents a subclass um, in this graphical notation. Um, and, um, or modulator is subcomponent of radio. Um, or, um, or a specific radio component is a subcomponent of a specific component. Um, so, so the meaning of these, so these are the relationships, these are examples of of domain-specific relationships. This is a generic subclass relationship. Um, this is like an aggregation relationship, that, as, as, as I showed before. I don't see have I don't have here any examples of individuals. Um, so hopefully this is clear. But if not, uh, please ask questions. So now, um, the, but pictures are fine and are very valuable for. Um, explaining things to people, but not particularly to computers. So computers need some kind of uh, formal representations of those concepts and relationships and so on. So to, to do this, we need a language, a language which has formal grammar and also formal semantics. So that's not, so sometimes the formal grammar, formal syntax, and formal semantics. If we have formal semantics, then it buys us the inference capability. Uh, so what's, what is inference? Um, the, this, the power of inference or the usefulness of inference is presented here. It says that if we have some explicit knowledge, if we have some explicit knowledge about the specific situation, for instance, related to spectrum, like the, the policies and so on, and specific requests, um, then the inference engine uh, can process this explicit knowledge and derive some knowledge that's not explicitly in in the in this part. Okay, so for instance, in the database, uh, whatever you have in the table, that's all the database knows. Uh, if if something is not in the table, the database does not know anything about it. Uh, it so it, the only thing in the date in the database you can do is just like to match. But the database don't have the in inference capability. Um, I'll show you later some examples of inference. So like I said, um, pictures are fine, but those pictures need to be represented in a, in a, in a formal language. And this is just a, a snapshot of a very small piece of the ontology uh, of, of uh, a representation um, of classes uh, and subclasses in the language of OWL. 
that's that's how it is uh, represented just just to give you a taste of what it looks like so now um, going back to this to, this, to the standard vocabulary in the wireless in innovation forum we have we have this effort uh, of developing a so-called CRO or cognitive radio ontology and this 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 picture uh, is the top level of that ontology um, so it is um, this this is very important to start with the very uh, with with the well thought uh, top layer because because then everything uh, in when we go to more detail becomes um, very complicated and messy if you don't follow some kind of a very good structure at the top so this structure actually comes from uh, an effort um, so called so which is called Dolce. Um, Dolce is, is an ontology, top-level ontology, um, developed essentially by philosophers and linguists. And um, so in this, very, what's important here in this is that uh, there is a basic distinction between objects and processes. Uh, quantities, of course, too, and units of measure and value. So these are the only top-level classes. Everything else is some class of, of whatever classes we have here. So. The distinction between object and process is kind of philosophical because, um, um, because it, uh, for instance, um, if you take a specific object, let's say a ball, um, and the process of, uh, uh, or, or so let's say a person, a person who is running. So, so the process of running is a process, but the person who who participates in this process is an object. So, a process cannot cannot be described by just one snapshot. A person can be described essentially by one snapshot, but the process is not. So this is the top level ontology uh, structure of the CRO developed at MLM. Uh, and um, uh, here's a description of uh, a little bit more information about this uh, ontology. So it was <coughs> uh, voted um, in 2010, supported by the forum. It is available here at this link. Uh, it covers lots of basic terms of wireless communication from uh, the physical layer and Mac layer. Um, um, so the, the development was based on, on, on a number of use cases. As I said before, so it has seven use cases and, and this ontology covers some of those use cases. We also consider it FM3TR, which is a special simple kind of waveform. Uh, from which we derive some ideas from this ontology. Um, uh, and we also derived some ideas from the transceiver facility APIs, which was developed at the forum. Uh, the ontology has 230 classes uh, and 188 properties or relationships. Uh, so it's a relatively sizable ontology, but not terribly large. And, and we're not claiming this is complete, so we, we, we're still working on this ontology and plan to extend it. In particular, recently we started interacting with, uh, with MITRE and uh, John Stein in particular, um, who uh, developed this uh, approach which is called Model Based Spectrum Management, MBSM. And we are trying to express the concepts of MBSM in, the, in this CRO. So we at this point, it's just my personal belief that those concepts are expressible, uh, at least to some degree. But um, uh, but we'll have some more detail on this once we um, um, progress uh, with this work further. Now, the ontology um, for policies uh, or the policies actually need to to include also some so-called deontic um, deontic terms. So the ontic um, comes from the fact that we have, whenever we say that something is allowed or disallowed, um, well, is that all we can say? And actually, in philosophy, there is this the ontic um, ontology idea, and <coughs> um, so in, in this in this concept, actions are classified as possible. Uh, as permissible and permissible, uh, or prohibited, optional, and obligatory. So the policies don't state whether things are true or false. Policies have to say that something is should be done, can be done, or might may be done, and so 
And so those three terms here, obligatory, optional, uh, no, and prohibited, capture those ideas. So the ontology, the CRO ontology does not include this, but we are um, planning to add this um, to the ontology in the future. Now, the, in, in these pictures, like before, those actions are represented here um, as, as I shown in the previous pictures. Now, the policies themselves also have to be representable uh, somehow in an ontology. So the question is, um, how are they represented? So this, this is a very simple ontology for policies. As you can see here from this picture, the policy is here. The so the purpose of the policy should be stated somewhere. This is essentially kind of a description of what it is for. And then the policy consists of rules. So its policy is a collection of rules. The rules are represented as strings. The rules govern operations. So for instance, transmit is an operation. So the rules govern this transmit operation. Okay? Um, and uh, the, this, you say here this is sometimes we use operations, sometimes actions. So, so operations and actions are treated as the same in, in actual or ACT. Um, so each operation um, occurs at a specific time. Each operation in, is executed by a specific agent. So in this case, for instance, a radio, a specific radio. And uh, some entities may participate in this, uh, in this um, uh, operation. So for instance, specific spectrum or spectrum range, uh, band, uh, um, uh, spectrum channel, whatever, uh, participates in this operation. Okay, so that's the ontology for policies. So everything is kind of organized along ontologies. Um, now, the policies need to be expressed. So I showed you a representation of policies in, in text. Uh, and then I showed you some, on, some ontolo ontologies that could help us represent policies. But ontologies describe really classes and, and, and uh, things, but policies describe operations. So the question is, uh, how do we represent those policies? Um, so in our approach here at Vistology, we, we use SBVR, which is Structured English um, uh, part of this SBVR. Um, so SBVR stands, I should have a somewhere, um, I'll, 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 okay, it stands for semantics of business vocabulary and rules. It, it is a standard of, of, of the OMG, Object Man Management Group. It supports the ontic terms, and actually also has alitic terms, which I didn't talk about. It has corresponding XML representation. It allows for things that we really need for uh, our policies, and it allows for things like to say some, all, each, every, and so on. It, the expressions sometimes are somewhat weird, uh, but what can we do? It's not, it's not purely English. It's somewhat some English, kind of close to English, but not really English. So here is an example uh, of, of a policy um, expressed in SBVR. So it's, the, the policy is here. It says, it is prohibited that a person that is not an adult reads a picture with mature content. So as you can see, this is not quite um, English, but it's pretty close to English. So once um, using um, in the tool that we are working on here, which is called uh, Allvisor, uh, this kind of policies can be written as BVR. Then, that then, then can be convert, converted to XMI and then translated to base visor rules. Base visor is an inference engine um, that we use here at Vistology, developed at Vistology. And its internal language is called BVR. So those rules are expressed in, uh, translated to BVR automatically and then the base visor can execute the, these rules and make decisions about the policy decisions. So BV, the base visor essentially interprets policies. Now there's one issue that I just want to, to touch upon very uh, briefly, which is the issue of differences in policies. What if um, one uh, node has a policy that does not agree with the other policy? Then what do we do? They are inconsistent among, between the two. So um, 
essentially the picture is presented like this. If, if there is an intersection that both policies agree, then the process of reconciliation can take place. And so therefore, those transmissions that are within this trend, those transmissions of those operations, those actions that, that are within this intersection can be allowed, but these uh, outside would be disallowed. Okay, so that's just, just mention of this a little bit more complexity, but what can we do? Um, so that was all I wanted to say about DSA, and now, like I said, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on the things beyond DSA. So cognitive radio, as, um, as essentially uh, defined by uh, Joe Mitola, was had this definition. So it was not really um, just for DSA. It, it, it was proposed as, as a type of radio in which communication systems are aware of their environment, it's not just spectrum, and internal state, and can make decisions about the radio operating behavior based on that information and predefined objective. So, so this is much wider definition than just DSA. Uh, among uh, capabilities of cognitive radio might be sensing and information collection, query, so the radio should be able, uh, be able to answer queries by, by user or by other radios, so the radios actually could talk to each other, ask questions, and response to question, respond to questions. Uh, they should be self-aware, so the radio should be, uh, should be able to understand their own structure and uh, their capabilities and so on. They should be able to make decisions autonomously um, and, and they should respond to commands from other radios. Um, so essentially, in this case, the radio is viewed as, as an agent that interacts with the environment and informs some actions on the environment um, based on its own goals. Um, so those things in the, in the context of cognitive radio, they are sometimes called um, knobs and meters. Knobs and meters are probably the more better terminology. Um, so if we look uh, at this from the control theory point of view, here we see the SSR, System Strategy Reasoner, who has its own goal, and it, it uh, turns the knobs in, on, on the radio platform, and then the radio platform responds, some, responds to, to, to the knobs somehow and to the environment, and which uh, we, the meters can be taken and the quality of service or whatever measure can be computed, and that, that measure can be used, sent back to the controller, and uh, the controller, the SSR, would again decide what to do about the knobs, whether to keep them the same or, or, or modify them. So this is a very simple picture of this more complicated picture, which is known as the cognitive architecture or cognitive radio architecture. That's essentially a, a, an OODA loop developed uh, some long time ago. I, I don't have time to talk about this. So um, we implemented, at Northeastern University, we implemented this, uh, what was called OOBR, ontology-based radio. It was implemented in 2003 and, and then modified later on. But the main idea here is the data, uh, that the control messages are inserted in the data stream, and then when they arrive at, at the node, they are separated out and they were sent to the reasoner, and the reasoner decides what to do and then possibly uh, either mo mo modifies its own knobs or sends those knobs to the other radio via the RF. Um, so that's, that's how uh, we implemented this at Northeastern University. So the idea here is that there are um, two set, two, two kinds of types of communication, so the data uh, or voice um, uh, channel and the control channel here. So this is the control channel, but it's still in the message uh, stream. Um, so that's a, just a refinement of the same picture. I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, so the current radios um, typically cannot uh, have some limited flexibility limited expressivity, scalar variables can be, can be sent back and forth, and essentially pretty much everything is limited by the protocol. So, uh, so if the protocol uh, allows for representing of this, the representation of these fields, so those fields are um, obviously clearly interpreted by the protocol. There's, but, but we are talking about inserting control messages into this data. Um, we did some investigation uh, with uh, to compare the expressiveness of uh, the utility of OWL versus XML. In particular, as I said before, OWL provides inference, 
So the idea here is that if if we compare um, uh, what needs to be sent between two radios using XML, so in this case 6,609 6, facts would have to be sent. But uh, on the other hand, if the radios have a local inference capability, not, not everything needs to be sent because some of the facts can be inferred locally from the, from the ontology. So therefore, uh, only 1692 facts would have to be sent. Um, so I promised you to say some, a few words about uh, examples of inference. So here are some examples which, which says like uh, whether particular frequency bands are contiguous, overlapping, covering, whether requested frequencies, bands, times, transmission locations, power level, level satisfy particular policies, uh, inferred user's role, for instance, like for security, whether security requirements are satisfied, uh, whether the content of a message can be sent, provided metadata information about the content is provided. Okay, so, um, so, so even looking inside of the messages, what's inside, uh, and so on. So I'm not going to talk about this. Um, or uh, whether a spe specific transmission is within the constraints of a given model, like in, 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 the, in the MITRE proposal of MDSM. Um, so just, I already introduced MLM. Uh, which is working on development of the language, uh, ontology, use cases, um, and policies, um, and uh, um, so that's the goals. And uh, we are we collaborate with P1900.5. We have a memorandum of understanding with P1900.5. Um, so here is the contact for P1900.5. Um, and um, and like I said before, the, the goal of MLM is to, to, to provide some standards for communication, not just about um, DSA, but about lots of other stuff. So this picture shows that there are lots of standards for communicating particular issues, uh, but MLM is supposed to kind of cover all. And so these are the issues to talk about, and these are the particular users that would, might want to, or actors that might want to uh, exchange information about these things. Um, so that's the summary uh, of the policy-based radio control, not just DSA, uh, in which uh, the behavior of the radio is controlled by local policies. Policies are expressed in declarative form with an ambiguous semantics, for instance, owl and rules. Um, we have a uh, standards-based inference engines, for instance, base visor or other inference engines which are standard for OWL. Uh, policies are separated from implementation, so um, modification of radio behavior becomes flexible. Uh, this certification process hopefully is simpler, although we don't have any examples as, as yet. Um, and the policies are abstracted, uh, represented at a more abstract level, and this is the inference uh, capability that I've shown before. Um, to close up, I just wanted to uh, show some um, uh, advertisement here. <laughs> uh, we just published a book which is called Flexible Adaptation in Cognitive Radios. It is by Shu Jun Li and myself. Uh, this is based on Shu Jun's uh, PhD thesis. The book is available. Um, and um, that's all. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. Thanks, Mitch. So if anyone has any questions, um, again, you can use your question window to type them in, or you can raise your hand and I can unmute your microphone. So uh, are there any questions? Okay, well, um, not hearing any. Again, thank you, Mitch, for, uh, for your presentation. I uh, found it very informative. Um, why don't I, uh, I'll take back uh, the presentation and, um, and wrap up the webinar. Okay, thank you very much. So if anybody has questions offline, please email them to me. Uh, I'll be more than glad to answer.
So in wrap-up for this uh, presentation, um, just let everybody know that we're going to have uh, additional webinars scheduled in January and February. The, uh, the webinars will um, be announced shortly, so please uh, check back on the website and um, you'll get the information when it's available. Um, there's going to be a link that's sent to you to our webinar satisfaction survey. Uh, there'll be an email sent out after this uh, webinar completes. And in that webinar, there'll be a link to a satisfaction survey. Uh, if everybody who attended could please fill that out, we really appreciate it. Um, we use the feedback you provide us to make this uh, webinar series better in the future. And again, if there's uh, any questions, feel free to contact either Mitch or myself, and um, and we'll uh, we'll respond as quickly as possible. So that's it for today's webinar. Thanks everyone for attending, and thank you again, Mitch, for for your presentation. And uh, one last call for questions, and then we'll uh, we'll close it close the uh, the session. Okay, uh, we'll close the session then. Thank you very much.